Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Disrupt, the Museum of Political Corruption film screening and discussion series. My name is Veronica Medina Matzner. I am a Brazilian documentary filmmaker and a trustee of the Museum of Political Corruption. We are a nonprofit, nonpartisan institution dedicated to educating and empowering the public by providing a better understanding of political corruption and encouraging solutions that promote, eth that promote ethics reform and honest governance. After a short summer break, I am very excited to be back here tonight with our Disrupt Film series featuring impactful contemporary movies and live roundtable discussions. Disrupt seeks to further the museum's mission to empower and educate the public by showcasing socially, re socially relevant films and engaging conversations about contemporary issues that affect our everyday lives. This week, as many of us Americans start a new academic year, and as we send our children, our teens, our brothers and sisters back to school, one of our primary concerns is school safety. Tonight, we're honored to present an in-depth conversation about the documentary After Parkland. Released in 2019, 14 months after the shooting at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida, After Parkland offers an intimate chronicle of families as they navigate their way through the unthinkable, reckoning with unexpected loss, journeying through grief, and searching for new meaning. Yet before Parkland, there was Sandy Hook. Before Sandy Hook, there was Virginia Tech. And even before that, there was Columbine. According to the Washington Post database of school shootings, more than 300,000 students have experienced gun, vi gun violence at school since the 1999 shooting in Colorado. And millions of others have been impacted by these events at some level. So today, in recognition of the International Day to Protect Education from Attack, we have the privilege to hear the personal stories of people who have experienced this issue firsthand, many of whom are still learning to process and live with what has happened. As a new school year begins in America, we hope that students and school staff everywhere create only memories they can look back at fondly. I hope you all have had an opportunity to watch the film ahead of, ahead of tonight's discussion, but here's a quick look back at After Parkland. But before we do that, I have an important disclaimer. Please be advised that the, the teaser contains scenes of violence and distress. If you're sensitive to this kind of content, I would suggest that you walk away from your screen for or mute your compu computer for a couple of minutes. Thank you. And now the teaser. My daughter was Meadow Jade Pollock and she meant the world to me, and she's not here anymore. She was murdered on Valentine's Day over at this school, Stoneman Douglas. It's 252. Uh, I, I, I heard one gunshot, and we thought it was a drill initially, but it's not. And hopefully I left service. Oh, my God! I kept remembering, like, Will coughing up blood. All I kept thinking in my head was, please be safe, please be safe, over and over. Let's go! The day after was my birthday. My boss saw me. He said, dude, you don't look like a kid anymore. You have no idea what it feels to get back home and not having your son here. Getting in a plane crash, surviving, and getting on the same plane every day where the one issue that caused it isn't fixed. Let me go first. Out of my way, buddy. You gotta shut down the social media and go to bed. So does the president. These little white ones are from the first bouquet of flowers that Joaquin ever bought me. all this power on what I have to do for everybody, every other kid in, the, in this country. I'm here marching for my boyfriend, Joaquin Oliver. There's a referee in Washington who's making calls 
in favor of another team for money. When politicians send their thoughts and prayers with no action, we say no more. You don't have to pay the price that we paid to understand what's going on. It is my honor and pleasure to introduce our moderator for tonight's panel discussion, the distinguished journalist, Thomas Capsidelis. He's a freelance journalist who worked at the Richmond Times Dispatch for 28 years. Capsidelis supervised the newspaper coverage of the Virginia Tech shootings as the on-site editor in Blacksburg on April 16, 2007. In 2016, he was selected as a one-year residential fellow at Virginia Humanities to complete work on after Virginia Tech. In 2020, he was inducted into the Virginia Communications Hall of Fame. And before joining the, the Times Dispatch, he worked um, as an editor at the writer and, and writer for United Press International and the State of Columbia, South Carolina. Capsidelis is a graduate of the University of Maryland and the Masters of Fine Arts Creative Nonfiction Program at Goucher College. He's currently a visiting assistant professor at journalism at the University of Richmond, where he resides. Good evening, Tom, and thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, Veronica, thank you so much, and thank you to the Museum of Political Corruption and the Disrupt Film Series for bringing us together. It, it's an honor for me to moderate the discussion tonight uh, with our distinguished panel on this most important documentary, After Parkland. It's as meaningful for us today, and in some ways even more so, than the day it was released in 2019. Just this past week, the students in Uvalde, Texas, have gone back to school after the tragic shooting there that killed 19 children and two adults on May 24th. There's been mass violence this past spring and summer in Buffalo, Illinois, Oklahoma, and Indiana, and the shootings in so many other communities that, that where the uh, violence doesn't get as much attention. Um, but this evening, we can draw some hope from our panelists, from their experiences, and from this documentary film that continues to teach us so much. And, and I'd now like to introduce our panelists, beginning with the filmmakers, Emily Taguchi and Jake Lefferman. Emily Taguchi is a journalist and filmmaker whose work has been recognized with multiple Emmy nominations and a DuPont Columbia Award. As a director, she is focused on telling complex and nuanced stories on the human experience behind the most pressing issues of our time. Her films have chronicled the lives of families navigating their way through the unthinkable after a school shooting, the dreams, prayers, and realities of asylum seekers seeking refuge in the United States, and the 11th hour efforts to revive a functionally extinct rhino species. She's recently joined CNN as a founding member of a new documentary production unit. Welcome, Emily. Jake Lefferman is a journalist and filmmaker living in New York he has crafted long form features and produced from the front line of breaking situations, including the Parkland, Pittsburgh, and El Paso shootings. He's worked at Hurricane Harvey and along the US-Mexico border covering immigration. His work aims to bring a cinematic style to stories rooted in journalism and includes the award-winning feature film, of course, After Parkland, which premiered at the Tribeca Film Festival in 2019. The documentary short, Asylum, and the Hulu documentary, The Housewife and the Hustler. He is currently the supervising producer for ABC News Studios, where his team crafts documentary projects exclusively for Hulu. Welcome, Jake. Thank you. Lori al Hadef was born and raised in New Jersey. She graduated from the College of New Jersey with a Bachelor of Science in Health and Physical Education and has an MA in Education from Gratz College. Lori has worked as a teacher at Union Township School and Windward School. In February 2018, her daughter, Alyssa, was tragically, tragically killed at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School. Lori and her husband, Dr. Elon al Hadef, have become school safety advocates. They founded the national nonprofit organization, Make Our Schools Safe. It's dedicated to protecting students and teachers from potential future shootings. Lori was recently elected to a second four-year term and the position of vice chair on the Broward County School Board. 
Welcome to Lori. Heather Martin is the co-founder and executive director of the Rebels Project, named after the Columbine mascot. The organization supports the survivors of trauma resulting from school shootings and other traumatic incidents. Heather was two days away from her 18th birthday when the shooting occurred during her senior year at Columbine High School on April 20th, 1999. After barricading in a small office for three hours, a SWAT team rescued her and the other students. Heather returned home physically uninjured, but the effects of the trauma she experienced that day continued to impact her in the following years. With the Rebels Project, Heather has traveled to communities to connect with survivors and help provide insight into the journey toward recovery and healing. The Rebels Project hosts an annual survivor retreat where survivors around the country come together for a long weekend of healing and connection. She's not only a national speaker advocating for informed responses to traumatic events, but she also teaches high school English in Aurora, Colorado. So thank you, Lori and Jake, Emily, and Heather for joining us tonight. And as we get underway, Lori and Heather, we want to say that we so appreciate be you being on the panel this evening, both of you being on the panel this evening. I know these topics uh, can be difficult to discuss, um, even for advocates who are accustomed to being in the public arena. Um, I think I speak for everyone here this evening that we first offer our deepest condolences to you, Lori, um, for your family's loss um, and to all who have suffered in, um, in the Parkland community. And to Heather, we'd like to extend our sympathies for all that you and your community experienced at Columbine and the loss of friends and loved ones and community members. Thank you in advance for sharing your perspectives this evening and helping us understand how we can uh, sharpen our empathy, sharpen our involvement, and contribute to uh, and contribute to solutions today. So, as we are centered our program tonight around the documentary, uh, I'd like to begin our questions for the panel with Jake and Emily. Um, first, congratulations on this, the great work that you've done in the documentary. I want everyone to see the entire hour and a half, but I think you've made such a compelling case for reform, our desperate need for reform, in just the first 20 minutes. I, I found it also very moving and reminiscent of the stories um, that I've reported on in my writing. Um, and maybe you could start us off by telling us about the origin of your work and how it evolved on the way to becoming a finished documentary. Sure, thank you uh, for your kind words and thank you all for you know letting us come here today. I think we're honored that years later, this continues to spark a conversation. Um, so Emily and I were both working as producers at Nightline at the time. Uh, and so we go to these breaking news situations. It's, it's not the first that we've been to. Um, and sadly, you know, we've reported from several other mass violence situations before. So initially it started as a news event for, for what our, our jobs were at Nightline. Uh, and I think the more time we went down there, uh, the more families that we met and, and as people opened their doors to us and, and opened their homes to us, we felt that there was more here. Uh, and, and we really just kept going back and and documenting and speaking with people. Uh, and, and after a couple of weeks, it was clear that this felt different, that this community um, wasn't letting this, this move, you know, wasn't letting people turn their attention away from what happened. They were demanding that the nation keep watching and keep listening. Uh, and so we were able to talk to our team about spending more time down there uh, and ultimately doing a feature film. Emily, um, your voice is heard on the documentary asking questions. And um, I know that um, even for uh, experienced journalists, um, reporting these uh, reporting these types of stories is very difficult. Um, how did how would how was that? How did that experience evolve for you? And um, uh, can you talk, talk? I think people often wonder uh, how difficult it is for journalists in these situations. But there's also, it's also very difficult to uh, speak with people who have suffered a uh, great loss. Can you describe a little bit of the reporter's uh, sensibility and sensitivity that, that you all tried to bring to the documentary? Yeah, I think um, 
it I will never forget the experience of interviewing the families and the students that participated in the film and continue to open their doors to us. We were visiting at some of the most difficult moments um, because we were trying to capture milestones. Um, to add to some of what Jake was talking about, the other reason um, why we were able to continue returning, um, like Jake referred, um, was that the community really didn't want to um, have the conversation stop and therefore there were walkouts, there was the March for Our Lives, there were different um, efforts to keep the story um, on people's minds that allowed us to go down um, to Florida. And each time we would develop a closer relationship with each of the families. Um, but like I said, um, sorry, my office lights are going out, but um, <laughs> Um, you know, we were knocking on their doors at times like prom and graduation, um, which are very difficult uh, reminders of what they had lost. And so I can't tell you how grateful we were to be able to speak with these um, the participants and the families who um, invited us back time and again. We were always very aware um, and really tried our best to not re-traumatize anybody um, by asking them um, anything that they didn't want to um, speak about. We wanted to make sure that everybody was aware that they had the, um, they were able to make the call about when to stop filming at any point in time. Um, that was really, really important to us that they had family around them if they wanted that and that if they weren't up for it, then we would just back off. You know, our uh, we had very understanding um, teams back in New York and executive producers back in New York that understood that sometimes you just can't right. um, and that people need space and people need that respect. And I think um, at the bottom of it all is just our desire to relate to these families as people. Yes, thanks, thanks so much for sharing that and describing your experiences of going back again and again and establishing uh, relationships. Um, you know, one of, the, one of the wonderful things about this documentary is that I think it really uh, shows us uh, the power of advocates power of ad advocacy that grows from uh, traumatic uh, situations. Uh, advocates are ahead of the curve on um, urging some of the changes uh, or changes that we've seen in, since mass shootings. There haven't been enough, but those that we've, those, those that have been accomplished, I think the credit has to go to the advocates for uh, pushing their, pushing these agendas uh, relentlessly uh, across Many different topics that uh, people may not know completely know all, all about all the different ways that advocates work. And Lori, uh, you've chosen uh, to form the, the, uh, the School Safety Foundation, um, and 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 you've operated really like in two spheres and, and more as a grassroots activist and now uh, as an elected official. Um, uh, can you talk to us a little bit about um, your own path to advocacy? And um, and and some of the other, and some of the movements that have grown out of out of out of Parkland that uh, people may not be aware of. So sure. First, I just want to say that I personally am not in this documentary, uh, but and also I want you to know that um, this was my daughter Alyssa Aldaf, and my daughter Alyssa was murdered at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School on February 14th in 2018. And I've turned my grief into action, started the nonprofit organization, Make Our Schools Safe, and ran for the school board. Because I knew that in order for me to make change, that I needed to have a seat at the table and to be the voice for Alyssa. And Lori, um, how long after how long after the day did you, or how many weeks, or when did you, when did you set this path for yourself? 
So it honestly really started on February 15th uh, when I went um, to see and went on CNN. Um, I really I went to the park. I there was a group of reporters and I went down the line and I just told them I had something to say. And the first reporter just like brushed her hair and said, well, I'm not on the air. And I'm like, OK. And then I just went down. And, and to be quite honest, I had no idea what I was going to say. But um, the CNN reporter handed me a microphone and um, I was that mom that called for action from President Trump to do something and um, to make change. So I you know, tend to say that my advocacy started the day after. Um, I just had this burning desire that, you know, I, I couldn't just let Alyssa's death um, be where I just, you know, laid in bed, did nothing. I, I needed to be out there. I needed to have a voice. I needed to, and I know, and I continue to make change. And uh, we'll get back to this uh, later in the program as well, but can you tell us briefly about uh, your legislative accomplishments that, that you've made with your foundation? Yeah, so uh, me and, and the other uh, families that lost someone that day, we all helped pass the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas Act. That was a significant piece of legislation here in Florida. But I have, and my husband, Dr. Elon Aladef, through Make Our Schools Safe, we've passed Alyssa's Law, which is a panic button in schools. So if there is a life-threatening emergency situation, the teacher will be empowered to push a button, either an app on their phone or something they wear around their neck. And it's directly linked to law enforcement so they can get on the scene as quickly as possible to either triage the victims or take down the threat. And so Alyssa's Law, we've passed now in New Jersey, just recently in New York, and then also in Florida. And our next state, it will be Texas. And again, this is, I think, an example of work that goes on behind the scenes that uh, people may not know about. And and the work of the work of advocates really is 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 unceasing. I think that um, as uh, I think in news coverage, uh, it's kind of the nature of news coverage that we focus on when action is proposed and when action has taken place and the debate that runs up to it. But I think we don't often go back enough to uh, talk about the work in progress, which goes, it extends after legislatures convene, it extends after school boards finish their work for the night and the, the real discussion gets underway uh, about how to get things done. So um, really appreciate you being here tonight and, and talking about your work, um, talking about your work at the local, state, and now the national level. And Heather, I, I wanted to ask you about, uh, I wanted to ask you about um, the film and what and what it um, what it uh, what the topics covered in the film uh, conjure for you as it relates to your work on helping uh, survivors through their long term uh, processes of recovery and healing. Hi, <laughs> um, thank you so much for that question because truly I felt like. The film captured so much of what I remember the aftermath of Columbine to be like. Um, and truly it was, it captured it in such a way that was so real. Um, it was difficult for me to watch some parts of the documentary because of the reminders. But what struck me the most, I think, was that the similarities between between situations um, and really maybe not so much situations because the events themselves were very different um, and everybody's experience with each event was very different, but the afterwards, like the process and um, like that was very universal. Um, it brought back a lot of, um, I mean, sometimes painful memories, but truly the parts that still get to me today are when I see people coming together, coming together in the aftermath. And while what brought the people together in the first place is terrible, um, those are the parts that move me the most now. Like I still struggle to see, I mean, whenever I, a big group of people all coming together for something that um, it usually like chokes me up a little bit. So I really appreciated that that portion was also included in the film. And 
I, and I think you're absolutely right about uh, some of the uh, some of the similarities um, and uh, many of the things in the in the documentary uh, struck me as similar to the experiences of the uh, Virginia Tech families and survivors and um, uh, and community. Um, can you tell us a little bit also about the Rebels Project and its and its and some of its uh, directions? Sure. Um, so. The Rebels Project was formed after the shooting at the Aurora Theater. Um, and that was 13 years after the shooting at Columbine. And it, essentially what happened for me and a lot of my classmates was, you know, we were re-traumatized continuously with things on the news, things happening. Um, I specifically remember Virginia Tech is one of my um, vivid memories in that uh it's the reason why I don't watch the news anymore or I don't follow things because I mistakenly turned on the news after getting um, like, I think it, I was getting like pages probably at that time, maybe not so much text messages, but you know, don't watch the news, don't watch the news. And I was like, Ooh, let me see what's happening. And I did and just happened to catch the end of the perpetrator's manifesto, um, which I turned off the news and it took probably two or three days before um, the, I just had started having debilitating anxiety attacks. It was really bad for, and this was years after Columbine. So after the shooting in Aurora, um, because it's Aurora, Colorado is about 30 ish miles from Littleton, Colorado, where Columbine is. And my friend Jen and I, we were just texting back and forth and like, what, what could we do? What were we missing? What did we not have access to? And how can we help? Because that helpless feeling happens after every single event. I feel helpless again. I'm thrown back into that, you know, the trauma that I experienced when I was 17. And we realized that what we needed the most was somebody to talk to and somebody who understood because trauma and grief the process is very universal, but there's some very distinct differences with something of this magnitude. And namely, one of the biggest differences has to do with the media's exposure to it. So that makes the trauma even more complex. Um, so we started, we were basically like, hey, let's do a support group for people who have survived mass shootings. And the day after the Aurora Theater shooting, um, we were kind of up and running, if you will, trying to reach out to the community, um, all the while knowing that after Columbine, we really just didn't want a whole lot of people encroaching on our community. It was a lot for us. Um, so since then, um, unfortunately, there is a huge need for us still. Um, we also realized that even years after Columbine, a lot of us were still struggling because we didn't get the help that we needed at the time. And long-term recovery is, I mean, it's a process. It's its a marathon, not a sprint, as Frank DeAngelis says all the time. I, <laughs> um, And, you know, there's now we visit impacted communities. You know, I have been out to Coral Springs, I think three times now, um, and talk to people, connect people, because there's not much else like being able to talk to someone who gets it and knowing that you won't be judged. Because I think that's something that survivors are very sensitive about is outside judgment from people who just don't get it. So I'm very proud of the Rebels Project and all the things that we've accomplished um, in the years since since we started. So it's great, great work that you all are doing. And Lori, uh, back to you, uh, some of the things that Heather said um, you've experienced some of those same feelings as well. And, um, how, uh, and this summer with the sentencing phase going on is must be extremely difficult for you and your family. Um, what are your thoughts or your strategies for helping people in your community, uh, and how, how you all, uh, bind together through these difficult moments that are taking place several years after the, the, the tragedy? tragic event. Yeah, so we have Eagles Haven in our community. And Eagles Haven is a place where people can 
go to connect with mental health resources. They also do a lot of activities like yoga, rock painting, uh, bringing people together. So people know that they're not alone, that they have a place to go. And I think that's extremely important when you are going through trauma and our community now is going through the trial. It is very painful and it's, it's an important uh, very important for people know where to get help that they're not alone um, we also have therapy dogs and i think um like i my family we have a golden doodle her name's roxy and she's very helpful with therapy with um, myself my husband and my two boys uh with the loss of Alyssa. you know it's so painful and so horrific it's such a tragedy but these things that we put in place to to help us get through each day. Um, a lot of mutual support there in the Parkland community then. Well, absolutely. You know, the Parkland community has been a family to my family, always there, has our back, um, and, and we know that we are loved and supported. Difficult, uh, certainly difficult times, but uh, Good to hear about the mutual the mutual support there. Um, just to go back to uh, 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 Jake and Emily, um, and I think this kind of fits in with um, fits in with some of the some of what we've uh, discussed. Um, Jake, you mentioned as we got ready for the program this week that uh, that you and um, that. Uh, that you and Emily have thought deeply over the years about what you refer to as the ripple effects of mass violence. And, and that's something, your description of it kind of really kind of tracked with some of my own feelings on that also. And for the viewers tonight, can you talk about the, the ripple effects and what you've contemplated since the, the completion of, of the documentary? Yeah, I mean, w when you are in the work that we're in and you go into a community to report something like this, I think, you're there and you report and then you leave. And I think what we didn't fully appreciate until we'd spent a year or so with these families was just how deep that grief and trauma is and how it ripples past, you know, you know how one act of violence can have such a deep and layered ripple effect through the community, through a family. Um, that will never not be there. And so I think the closer we got to the individuals that we worked with in the film, um, the more time we spent with them, I think just the more aware and the more real that became to us. And we'll never begin to imagine that, but I think spending time with them, we, we saw that in a more profound way. And so when I went to Pittsburgh to cover that and, and when we went to El Paso, I think it hit us in a different way because we more fully appreciated um, what those ripple effects looked like. Um, Heather and Lori, when you hear Jake talk about the ripple effects, how does how does that how has that shown up in your own, in your own experiences? I'm going to go first, Heather. Oh, sure, sorry. <laughs> um, it's truly it it ripples. <laughs> I don't want to say forever because it. Another thing that we can provide, just given that it's been 23 years since Columbine, is kind of like hope. It does get better. You know, things get better. Um, it changes. And the, the ripples are so interesting because I feel like I can I can speak from my personal experience in that, you know, I was a physically uninjured survivor um, present at the school that day. And really like my story wasn't super important. It didn't really like matter, quote unquote, in the big scheme of things. And I just really felt forgotten or like that I didn't have a right to be traumatized because I hadn't been shot. Like I didn't even consider myself a survivor for 10 years. I mean, it was like 10 years before I owned that. So that ripple effect, it not only impacts, you know, the the victim's families and those who are physically injured, but those who are in the building, the community around it, the people working at the 
you know, the mail center that are receiving all of these things that are coming from around the world and neighboring schools and the children at those neighboring schools. And, you know, we were getting letters from around the world. So it truly does impact everyone on some level like that, that ripple goes out and it's almost like you can't fathom the depth of those ripples sometimes. Lori, is that like that? Has that been your experience as well? That you can't fathom the depth of it. That seems like a very good way of putting it. No, thank you, Heather, and I agree with you. But I also think that the the effect of the shooting at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School, the ripple effect is in turn that we are now really we dug in and really looked at the safety at our schools, and the school safety has been increased tremendously since 2018. And it's not only at a Broward schools level, but it's also at a state and a federal level where now we're getting additional funding at a federal level and at the state level where we have the Florida Office of Safe Schools that is looking at all the minute details of pieces of school safety and helping our schools. I mean, we just also another ripple effect was from the shooting was the uh, the um, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas Commission that was brought together to dissect all the pieces of how what led up to the shooting and the day of the shooting. And then now just recently we had a grand jury report that was released that also went into greater detail. So these effects. I mean, is, is, is definitely a ripple effect, but I think, you know, and unfortunately my daughter was only 14 years old, her life had to be lost and 16 others, but for now change to occur. And I think the impact and the voice of the families and the students from Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School, not only made those changes here at a local level in Parkland, but also nationally and probably internationally across the country. Uh, those are those are great uh, those are great observations. And, and speaking about the um, speaking also about the uh, speaking also about the uninjured survivors, um, Heather found it interesting that you had mentioned that it took you ten years to really own that. Um, I came I came somewhat late in the research and reporting of my book to recognize that as a, as a key topic. And um, the person who really kind of um, helped me better understand that was an uninjured survivor um, who became active in advocating uh, for the needs of uninjured, uh, uninjured, uninjured community members at Virginia Tech, close to the 10th anniversary of, um, of the shootings and has now become, uh, and has now become a major focus. And she, uh, uh, speaks widely, uh, speaks widely on the topic, and uh, it's very, it's it's very important. I'm so glad that you you, you brought that up, um, Emily. I wanted to ask you about a comment that you would made uh, earlier in the week about um, the universal universality universality of loss, and one of your this one of the things that you uh, lasting impressions of of working in this uh, field. Could you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, what I wanted to share was um, about just the human experience of um, what these families experience. And of course, um, you know, Lori and Heather um, can speak more to this than Jake and I as observers. Um, but gun violence and gun safety are subjects that tend to elicit a very strong um, politically based opinion um, that I think um, in notwithstanding the types of progress that Lori's already um, talked about and uh, the legislation that's come to be since the, um, the shooting at the um, Uvalde, um, it does tend to be much more divisive, whereas these types of violence um, that are inflicted, um, the ripple effects that we talked about are experienced by people on all parts of the political spectrum, regardless of where you stand on um, gun safety or gun violence. Um, I know that gun safety is a less politicized term than 
gun control or you know even gun violence um but for a long time there was just such an impasse that it was very difficult to talk about solutions um but you know we in the film um spent time with um in specifically two fathers who have very very different political beliefs um but their loss was deeply deeply felt each time um that has changed the course of their lives in immeasurable ways, as I'm sure that Lori can speak to as well. Um, and, uh, you know, it's something that they live with um, every day uh, for the rest of their lives. And I think, um, again, I refer to Lori, um, but one of the things, um, a conversation I had with Manuel Oliver, um, the father of Joaquin, who was killed at the school, um, I asked him, how do you find the strength to go on each day? Um, and I'll never forget, he said to me, you just think about surviving the next 24 hours and then you do it again. Lori, did you want to uh, jump in on Ella's comments? Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's very painful. And, you know, for me, I... I live for Alyssa and I even got that tattooed on my arm, live for Alyssa and Alyssa's being everything, her passion, her zest for life is what keeps me going. And that I know that I have to continue to fight to be her voice in order to make an impact and make a change and make a difference. Because I know at the end of the day, I have to send my two boys to school and we have to send our children to school and they have to be sent to school in a safe environment and they have to come home alive to their families. And so I have dedicated my life through my nonprofit organization, Make Our School Safe and being on the school board to find those ways, those layers of school safety protection to make our school safe. Thanks, Lori. And it's such a, a such a deeply meaningful comment that you have, because I think you're not only keeping uh, Alyssa's name and her memory front and center, but by doing that, just really empowering other people to uh, to to, uh, to to do that as well. And being a voice for people who uh, aren't in the public arena. So that's thank you for you know, thank you for sharing. Thank you so much for, uh, for, sh for sharing that. Um, I want to make a comment about, um, we had talked earlier about this, Heather, about some of the similar experiences that people have gone through. And I recall, I recall of uh, a comment that uh, Sam Zeff made in, in the documentary, um, that he'll always recall uh, the feeling of, the feeling of normalness. That is before the shooting, how it changed, like that, and it's it's almost like a, it, it's a, it reminds me of a comment that a Virginia Tech survivor told me, who said, the scariest part of this event, uh, beyond the event itself, was those few seconds of what is that noise, and then the world changed forever, and I think this is something again, it's kind of a the part of the universal nature of awful tragedies that we're, uh, that our communities are confronted with. And uh, Heather, I, you must hear many types of comments uh, along those lines and similar and similar uh, sentiments. Um, you have a whole organization of people who are survivors of uh, from different uh, shootings and mass violence. Uh, how do you all um, how do you all process um, all that you hear and, and, and convert it into uh, strategies that help people? Uh, that, that kind of varies person to person. Um, so our private online space has around eighteen hundred people in it. Um, we represent 
upwards last count, it's about 136 different um, communities that ex have experienced mass violence. Um, it's not always mass shootings, it's stabbings and bombings. Um, and we have some people from like 9-11, things like that. Um, a couple things stood out. So first, I just want to, <laughs> I think my computer, like my internet cut out right as you were saying some of the key quotes. Um, but something that stood out to me was um, this idea of normal and what that what that is now. Um, and a couple things is that when, because I graduated and kind of went off into, you know, the world and was completely a mess and didn't really have a system of support um, after Columbine, I didn't hear that phrase of like, this is the new normal. Like I hadn't heard that. And so like 10 years later, when I finally reconnected with Frank DeAngelis and someone said something about the new normal, that changed my life. Like I was like, oh my gosh, it is a new normal. Like this is something new that I have to get used to. And then I talked to some of like the Aurora Theater shooting survivors and they're like, I hate that phrase. I hate that phrase, the new normal. Like it just makes me so mad. And um, so it like means something different, I think, to each person. But the thing that for me, one of my like milestones that really like made a difference in my recovery was finally letting it sink in that like I will never be the person that I was on April 19th. I will never be that person again. I am changed. I am forever changed. You can't not be changed. And I think that for a long time, it's like I sort of knew that, but I didn't understand it. So once I finally could like digest that fully and just know that I am different and I would change what happened in a moment, but I am also a better person because of how I reacted in the aftermath and how I coped. And you and Lori both have just gone on to be such helps to so many people. Um, I think we are at a time where we can take some questions uh, uh, from the audience this evening. Um, Lucas asks, hi, Emily and Jake, uh, what are the characters in the film up to now? Some of them became nationally recognized names and quite vocal about gun safety. What about the others? How are they doing now? Um, I think that it depends on day by day. Um, and, uh, but it's again, to that point we spoke about earlier about the long effect and the before and the after and how it, there is no, going back. Um, I think that's very definitely true. Um, I know that Sam Zeif recently graduated college. Um, Brooke Harrison is in college. Um, Victoria Gonzalez, we've been in touch with um, quite recently as well. Um, and she is figuring out forging her next steps. Um, and the parents um, have been um, finding their own ways in affecting change. And Manuel and Patricia and Victoria were recently up in New York and we got to see them um, for Joaquin's birthday, um, which was painful, but also a celebration. And they, they do that every year. So it was really nice to see them and see that they are, they're doing okay. That's, that's, that's great that y'all stayed, stayed in contact, sure. Um, another question? Marcia asks, Lori, what has been some of the biggest challenges in working with different legislators and legislatures to pass Alyssa's law? So I guess, you know, it's just time because the legislative session is only a certain period of time. So you have to be able to reach out and connect with all the legislators to get them to understand what Alyssa's law is, panic buttons for mass notification, and get them on board with this idea, and then also getting funding attached to the law so it's a funded mandate. And all these legislative bodies, they work on their own time clocks, and you know, uh, you know, you've got an urgent need to get something done, but uh, it doesn't happen by deadline, then you've got to bide your time for a while. So it's, I think, I think the, uh, 
kind of the converting the action to the time, time frame is really difficult. Thanks, Marcia. I, I do have a quick story. Um, yeah. we, um, we're trying to get Alyssa's law passed in New York. My mom and I, and today's her birthday, uh, but we went to New York, to Albany, and literally in the last five days of the session, we moved Alyssa's law through the legislative process in like historic time. We went door knocking on all the doors, nine different floors. And, you know, I always say your voice is your power. And my mom and I, we got it done. We passed it through. And then Governor Hochul signed Alyssa's law into law. Well, congratulations to you all. And it's and congratulations to you all. And uh, happy birthday to your mom if she's with us tonight online. And I would also say that people ask me, uh, does it make a difference if I contact my legislator? And I say it absolutely does. Um, there, is there another question? Um, Bruce Roeder asks, how can we circle back to the Museum of Political Corruption? What forces create headwinds that make school safety harder, and what can we do? We'd like to take a pass at that. Well, I'll, I'll throw out. I'll throw out something based on my own observations, Bruce. I think that um, I think that um, advocates for helping people um, uh, protect themselves from gun violence, make safer communities, um, they are not, um, by and large, uh, large donors, uh, major players in legislatures or grassroots activists. Um, there are some money financial contributions really more that make themselves heard on the national level, but at the community level, um, it's, uh, it's an uphill battle. Um, it's an uphill battle for, uh, for people. And, uh, there needs to be a really constant push to make it an issue that rises, that rises to the, that rises to the top. Um, I think there's strength in numbers, uh, in the Virginia legislature, when the Democrats took over after the, um, shootings at the Virginia Beach Municipal Center in 2019, uh, reforms were finally uh, were, were finally enacted. Uh, so it, it can happen, but it is, it is an uphill battle. Um, and Lori, did you want to add something to that? Yeah, so I would say this. Please learn from the tragedy at Parkland, at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School, and the deaths. Please know that these school shootings, unfortunately, it will happen again. It can happen at your school. And I think what happened is people have blinders on, whether it's school board members, local officials, and learn from the tragedies that happened at these shootings and fix it and make those changes within your school to help make your school safer. Um, anybody else want to weigh in on Bruce's question? Um, do we have another question from the audience? Uh, Nico, Nico, I believe, if I'm reading it correctly on the screen, Rico. Tom, what was the process like for you to interview the families and hear the stories of people impacted by the mass shooting? It was, um, it was, uh, it was very emotional. Uh, my path to my work was a little bit different from um, Emily and Jake's. Um, I was the editor in charge of the coverage in Blacksburg uh, the week of the shootings um, and was very profoundly affected by what we had seen and what we reported there. Um, but I didn't start contemplating the, uh, writing a book until about three years after that. And um, I was very um, um, sensitized to the idea of how I would go about not only interviewing people, but interviewing them uh, three years later uh, and trying to uh, get enough time with them to uh, help me understand the issues, help me understand uh, what they were going through. So I think my, my first approach was that I, I just I took it uh, very easy and tried to uh, 
make sure that people understood uh, what I was writing about and that there was no rush that if, uh, if you wanted to talk to me next month instead of next week, that's fine. I was kind of in it for the, in it, in it for the long haul. Um, to, hear the, to hear the stories was very emotional. And the, and the longer that I worked on the book, uh, which is roughly from, in, in earnest really, roughly from 2012 until January of 2019, um, I became more and more affected by it. Uh, by the experiences and by the relationships I developed with people who I was writing about um, and uh, learned more as I spent more time with people. And in a sense, I, I feel like my work has, has never stopped. I haven't closed the door to doing something else in connection with this uh, with, the, with the topic, but I've, I've written some columns and uh, try to keep up as much as possible with um uh, what people have done, who I wrote about in the book. Have, uh, one more, I think we have time for more questions. Uh, Isaac, Isaac asks, hi, Heather, can you talk about watching the political cycles following these tragic events? How are you able to avoid becoming cynical? Um, well, a couple things. <laughs> I, you know, after I kind of caught that little bit of Virginia Tech, I don't typically follow um, the news or any kind of official things, it, kind of just for my own well-being. Um, I used to feel really guilty about it, like that it meant that I didn't care what was happening to people or that it didn't matter to me, but that wasn't really the case. Um, and truthfully, sometimes I do become cynical. Um, you know, I'm a high school teacher now. I, I teach seniors um, at a school right down the street from the Aurora Theater. Um, you know, we had a shooting this past year where six of our students were shot across the street from the school. Um, so I don't know if I, I think it just comes and goes. I don't know how much I avoid it, but I do know, you know, like I take school safety very seriously. Um, I do the safety presentations at my school every year to get, you know, make sure that everyone's got some buy-in because you've got that personal story behind it to like, hey, learn from Columbine. This is why we do the things we do. Um, and so, yeah, I guess <laughs> just to your question is like, sometimes I am cynical and sometimes I'm not. I just keep going and I aim for, you know, more resources for long-term recovery because it people need it in the long term. Thanks. Um, we still have more time for questions if there's another one. I think we may have reached the end of questions for now. Um, I'd like to go around, uh, let's, let's go around and uh, hear some uh, uh, final thoughts from the uh, from you all and, and to bring up any topics that we may not have gotten to yet tonight. Um, start with uh, Emily and, and Jake. Um, I would just say that, you know, when we got this um, invitation to participate in the panel, um, it, it was a, a realization that, um, you know, more than four years had passed. Um, and uh, even though we had, we've continued to, as uh, we mentioned, um, be in touch with the families who participated and they um, kind of um, followed how their lives have been changed. It was also this realization of the passage of time and um, the sadness that these events are still taking place and the things that we talked about tonight are still um, highly relevant. And I do look forward to the day when that kind of uh, reporting is no longer necessary. Yeah, I com completely agree. I mean, I was here in the office when Uvalde happened, you know, and the Nightline team once again went to work on that. Um, you know, we talked to some of the Parkland families that day and um, like Emily said, you know, I, I'm sad that this reporting is still so relevant. Um, but our goal in making the film was to do something that could spark conversation 
and that no, ma no matter where you sat on the political spectrum, you could watch and and hopefully find something in common with, uh, ex find a sense of understanding, find some common ground. Um, and so the fact that so many years later, um, we can have this conversation, um, it's truly humbling to us and, and we're really heartened that the film can keep have keep launching these conversations. So thank you. Well, thanks. Thanks so much for being with us tonight. I also want to say that um, uh, I know that that people are careful to watch uh, documentaries and, and televised reports that may that may be challenging in their content or how uh, violence is uh, reported. But I also want to say that I feel so deeply that um, after Parkland, um, not only contains reporting on moments of incredible hurt and loss, but uh, uh, just profound tenderness and and joy, um, and and finding some finding some success amid um, the day to day uh, the day to day struggles. Um, the, uh, the depiction of the, um, the love that was shown in uh, Joaquin's basketball team, the preparations for the prom, um, the uh, kind of just the love people have for one another. I think you can really watch uh, after Parkland and uh, appreciate it on so many levels. But in, in my opening remarks, I said that we can really draw some inspiration from it. And um, if you can you have to be able to watch um, the support that the young people have for one another. And it's on, on one level um, awful that they're put in the position to have to support each other over such awful situations. But uh, the manner in which they do it is, should be not only an inspiration to everyone um, on a personal, emotional level, but also uh, for legislators to grasp that this is a national crisis and that we need to do something about it uh, right right now. So I so admire what you all have done. And it has truly, it's, it's, it has really stood up as something that is meaningful to everyone today as it was when it came out. And I'm sure it will be, um, I'm sure it will be down the line. I think I read a review recently in the New York Times about how it's a now it can be a good, a good film to watch for students who are interested in uh, advocacy and you know, charting their way in, in, the, in the public arena. So, uh, thanks for all the work that you did and for all your comments tonight. Uh, Heather, some final thoughts from you or un 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 unaddressed topics? Um, n not necessarily unaddressed. I think that we've really talked about how it really does cover like that it, it gives the viewer like an idea because you can't really fathom it unless you've been through it like there's there's no way to do that but being able to watch that and like having gone through it like I hope it impacts other people on some way how it impacted me and touched me and moved me and um so it was really just, you know, a beautiful piece in its right and did, did I think what the intention was. And um, thank you, Heather. And thanks for, thanks for everything that you, uh, that you brought to the, the this evening. Uh, commend to everyone, uh, your website, the Rebels Project website and Lori's uh, Make Our Schools Safe website for information on uh, what you've been doing and what, uh, and what, and what Lori has been doing um, it really shows that um, people are getting things done. Uh, we need to translate that into action up the line, of course, right? Um, and Lori, um, thank you so much for being here this evening. What, uh, some final thoughts from you? Thank you so much for having me on the show, Emily and Jake. Thank you for doing the documentary. I think it's so important that 
we continue to talk about this, not just after another sh school shooting, but that we keep this conversation going and in the forefront, because that's the only way that we're going to make an impact and make change. So thank you. And if you're listening, please join the school safety movement by going to makeourschoolsafe.org. We have a volunteer handbook and we would love for you to be involved. Thank you. Thanks, Lori. Thanks. Thanks so much. And thanks to all of you. Um, you know, I, I think that um, I think that um, I had not seen the trailer until this evening and the um, striking uh, comment by Manuel Oliver at the end said, you don't have to suffer our loss. You don't have to suffer the loss that we did to know that something needs something needs to change. And I'm also um, um, I'm also struck by Sam's comment uh, before the basketball game started. Let's change the world. Um, so I think that I think we do need to change the world. And I think that part of how we can start is by discussions like this, learning more about uh, people's different experiences and uh, being informed and empathetic, uh, empathetic citizens, developing empathy and, and holding on and holding on to that and to not feel hopeless. So we've had some awful times since uh, the documentary was made. Uh, that summer of uh, that year, 2018, I was wrapping up my book, which was published in January of 2019, and rewriting the ending maybe six times between July and January of the, of the, of the, of the following year. And, um, and I'm saddened that we've had several years since then with, with um, so much violence. But I'm encouraged by all the advocates who I've met uh, in Virginia. Uh, I traveled from my book to uh, Texas and met uh, survivors from the 1966 tower shootings at the University of Texas and thought about their experiences, wrote about their experiences a half century later uh, in, in advance of the 10th anniversary of the 10th anniversary memorial of Virginia Tech. And really talking to survivors has really, really informed my reporting so much. I thought at the outset that my book would be very policy driven and it would focus on um, Second Amendment gun issues. Uh, but over time, through meeting different people, I expanded these themes to include uh, what's reflected in the sub subtitle, guns, safety, and healing. And I think safety and healing are, uh, are topics that uh, people can embrace. And I, and I loved what you said about um, the approaches and how um, Meadows' father and Joaquin's father were, were depicted in the documentary. And they had very different ideas about the issues but we really understood uh, we really understood them as people and the profound losses that they had suffered and i think this this helps in you know bridging in bridging some bridging some divides and i think that people can bridge divides one-on-one uh, -on -one in smaller groups and maybe be and be good influences uh, to legislators uh, up the line uh, i've seen progress i hope for more progress uh, I'm a optimistic person, and I have to admire everything that uh, survivors uh, brought to the table in these important debates. So um, I think for the museum, I think this uh, focus on citizen involvement, citizen empathy, and making your voice heard is uh, has to be part of the has to be part of the conversation all the time. So I'm. Uh, very grateful for uh, the chance tonight to meet everyone and to exchange ideas and to learn from our different experiences. And uh, Veronica, I send it back to you. And I want to thank again the Museum of Political Corruption, the Disrupt Series, and everyone who's joined us for the conversation tonight. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, please talk about these topics uh, at home, uh, at your workplace, at your schools, in your communities, and. Uh, and, uh, and be supportive of all these important efforts that are going on. Thanks and have a good evening.
Thank you, Tom. And thank you so much, Lori, Heather, Jake, and Emily. It was really an incredible moving conversation. And I want to thank you all very much once again for being here with us tonight and so candidly sharing your stories and experiences. Um, actually, one thing that I failed to comment on our conversation earlier was um, that in March of 2018, I was living in Albany, New York at the time. And my husband and I um, drove to Washington, D.C. to be there for the March of Our Lives, uh, for our lives. We knew that that was a remarkable event and it was really important that we were there to support the cause. And so to be here tonight, four and a half years later, um, hosting a conversation about that is actually quite an honor uh, for me personally and professionally. So thank you all so much. Um, and Disrupt is a collective effort and it has many hands and minds behind it. I'd like to thank the people who have helped us get here today. Bruce Roeder, MPC's founder and president, uh, who from the very beginning has been a huge supporter of this initiative. My amazing team, uh, Clara Huda and Bernardo Cunha for all their collaboration and hard work and for making tonight's event run so seamlessly. And to MPC's trustees and advisory board members for all their engagement and support. And thank you all, our audience, uh, for being here with us tonight. I would like to invite you all to join us in the museum's upcoming events. We have very exciting events happening this fall. On October 13th is our Nelly Bly Awards annual ceremony. We'll be honoring investigative reporter Jerry Mitchell. Uh, we are also planning a political cartoon competition to officially launch the museum's Thomas Nass Gallery. The initiative is being curated by the accomplished political cartoonist and journalist Clay Jones, and we'll have more information on that very soon. And on December 9th, please join us for a very special event celebrating the museum's anniversary and our last disrupt event of the year. I hope I'll see you there. Until then, take good care and good night. <laughs>